my screen and uh, I will reset or revolutionary contemporary problems of political stability and some ancient solutions. The West has seen a precedent in 77 years of peace. Post Europe, Atlantic peace and security, you know, all of them, guaranteed stability and prosperity. It was unthinkable before. But if it is so difficult to overestimate the advantages of the current state of affairs, why is it being challenged on a level not seen before? Where does all the anger and frustration come from? What did the advocates of the Western order miss, and why is the talk of peace, security, and rule of law, progress, and prosperity being dismissed by the rebels? In a word, why the most important and probably most successful post war political project of the West is so universally questioned? Paragraph first stability, unknown problem. European history was repeatedly being interrupted by political upheavals and natural disasters. Wars, assassination, revolutions, terror, resettlement, migration, market crash, famine, epidemic, they turn upside down the lives of every generation. To remedy the situation, a political thought has tried to harness the problem of economic and political instability since antiquity. Quote, remember, says Cicero, the establishment of a state which is stable enough to endure for ages, required by far the highest intellectual powers that nature can produce. Unquote. Ever since the politicians have looked into politics, law, economy, and security for ways to reduce the ephemeral nature of political entities to consolidate peace and to ensure polit political continuity. And those specific solutions might differ. If we imagine politics as a factor, its main product would be stability. If the world of politics were going anywhere, it would be towards a certain form of stability. Stability has always been the goal, albeit unattainable. There is a fine line between relative calm and prolonged stability. That's why in the past 77 years, we may have missed some fundamental changes. We may have overlooked the fact that we are living in the reality that everyone was seeking, but no one has ever experienced. Having dealt with so many of the old problems, we now found ourselves in a new territory, answering questions and threats we had not known before. And we begin to realize that, to our surprise, Progress is not the only variable of political order, of a stable political order. We realize that political and legal stability comes at a price and is not equipped with a built-in safety valve. Our view of European history makes us think of stability as the absolute good, the one that places all other political goals set. To fully understand why political, economic, and social structures of the modern world are being increasingly questioned by people in the West, we need to see whether stability itself, after almost eight years of peace, has become a civil problem that we somehow, somehow over. And what if the main political challenge today is the stability of the established order that turns against a large group of political community and takes away their dignity, freedoms, and hopes for a better future. Could unadjusted stability have become toxic and inhuman? Second paragraph, desire, desire for a revolution. Whatever the representatives of a political establishment in Europe and in, in the US tell us, the fact that the populists, who in the past were in the margins of the political scene in the world, have now take, taken center stage. Movements that are being described as populist differ in many ways. They may, be, they may be on the left or on the right of a political spectrum, open decryption or non-religious, 
anti or pro rational conservative or progressive. But is there a unifying principle beside they, they did contempt for the political elites? Are these movements nurtured by the same wave of the Euro Atlantic certain political expectation? And if so, how do we explain the strength, durability, and vigor? There are many factor, factors uh, that tell us that this, that this time it is not only the matter of a new voice finding a place on a political scene, but a total rejection of post-World War II status quo. The new dynamic is not to demand the healing of a system. These are not the political aspiration of the new elites anymore, or calls for a redistribution of wealth and prestige, but a total rejection of a state. They reject the system in its totality. The disappointed, the embittered, the furious. Polls conducted in February 2019 in Austria, France, Spain, Germany, Poland, and Italy by Institut d'Etudes Opinion et Marketing of France Internationale for Atlantico showed that almost 40% of French, 20% of Germans, and 40% of Poles think that the only way to the betterment of their lives is revolution. It is not about being critical or distrust towards the system, but it's total rejection. It is about the hope of some kind of brutal reset. Assuming that the respondents understand what the violent, dark, and irrational paradox known as revolution is, we need to appreciate that the, every fifth German and four out of 10 Frenchmen and women are in favor of a forceful demolition of the existing code. It is not pessimism, but desperation. To seek revolution after the lessons in European history in the 21st century is a field utterly hopeless. Some respondents may take revolution as a metaphor of some kind of fundamental change. But even in this case, it is clear that stability the most precious product of politics is seen as the main obstacle in, make, in making things better. Let us not be foolish. It's not a handful of freedom. But why is revolution the only agent of change that we live in? That paragraph end of book. I believe we do not fully appreciate the experience of the 2007 and 2008 economic crisis, which in fact undermined the social trust and hope that keeps us all going. It did not turn the system upside down, yet it, yet it shook the foundations of liberal or rather neoliberalism. The axiom of endless progress, the dogma of steady growth, has collapsed. The crisis undermined the belief that tomorrow will be a better day. It was not the exchange or real estate market that suffered, but the very core of an optimistic metaphysics of a democratic liberal world, of a snoozing message of purpose and hope for a better future. Why did hope that? The crisis not affect the system, but hit the most vulnerable. In a positive case scenario, the poor were to get less, but always more than the day before. In the negative case scenario, it turned out that they had to bear the cost. Stability, stability turned out to be more important than solidarity. In the name of stability, the world was saving and protecting the riches, as well as the institute have otherwise responsible for madness of the high-risk market. market. The rich and the wealthy come out of the crisis without major loss, while the poor just got poorer. And how about the community? If one measures trust in the existing order with the level of hope for a better life within a generation, the result is devastating. It may well be that stability was saved for a price of hope. According to the Pew Research Center, uh, conducted in 2019, the prevailing mood in many European countries is pessimistic. Fifty-two percent of Germans, seventy percent of British, eighty percent of French, sixty-one percent of Italians, and seventy-two of Spanish people think that this financial situation for the next generation 
will be worse than the situation of their parents. The crisis of hope that was the unifying, the hope which was the unifying principle of the system is plain to see. And there does not seem to be any other new unifying principle. The following the paragraph stability versus democracy. Focusing on stability makes it difficult to see the negative effect, the effects of unwaving. What do we miss? It seems that during the prolonged period of peace, democratic states generate conflict they are not able to manage on their own ground. The conflict is between the status quo safeguarded by law and politics and the intuition based on the principle of equality and freedom. Politics that successfully stabilize legal and economic system automatically consolidate hereditary differences in wealth, income, social standing, and educational power. Simultaneously, through education and the ethos of democracy, politics strengthens the need for freedom and equality, the kind not only as equality under law or equal opportunities, but as political agents, which allows one to choose and control any form of power. In fact, we are facing the tension between, between justice and freedom, which Plato says is typical of democracies. To this tension, the post-war political system added a third factor, time. Time, or more precisely stability, transformed this otherwise positive tension into conflict. As Plato tells us, the right kind of balance between justice and freedom, justice and aristocratic element, and the more popular element of freedom, so the right kind of balance protect democracy against anarchy. More importantly, it reinforced the existing order without cancelling freedom and equality, the main virtues of democracy. By harnessing the capriciousness and the volatility of demos, which threaten the state order, law protects democracy against its potentially self destructive element. For example, law protects against tyranny or against macro. Post-war system of a democratic state which follows the same model and is built on the rule of law is now being destabilized by its longevity. The balance now is toward the aristocratic element, the system toward the principle of justice. After 77 years of peace, the system which maintains the stability, in fact, begins to conserve the mechanism of inheritance of differences and divisions. In practice, it means the cancellation of egalitarianism and the advent of the increasingly undemocratic, paradoxical rule of law. Due to the time factor, a variable which may have seemed irrelevant at first, the democratic component of aristocratic system meets system becomes fiction. The new generation has no chance for everyone of its members to have a prep star point from similar position and equality and freedom, especially positive freedom, becomes empty. So, yeah. Although Thomas Piketty claims that the modern concentration of capital is similar to that at the turn of 19th century, Nevertheless, thanks to democratic culture of equality, we feel the rift between egalitarian ideals and the aristocratic practice that we find hard to accept. The growing awareness of differences and inequalities is in stark contrast with the declared ideal of political system and hyper-democratic rhetoric in the field of education and culture. That is how politics itself highlights the problem of injustice of a prevailing order. The paradox is that the politics places herself in the dock. And there is the rap. This is the source of an unbearable tension between law and general intuition of justice, which is where the revolt 
begins. What seems to be fueling the political revolt is the call for a reset. At stake is a reversal of the effects of prolonged stability and almost mythical come back to the point of departure in which existing divisions and differences do not cancel the egalitarian principles of democracy. The way the protesters see the crisis is through the feeling of a radical lack of political agents, radical lack of political agents. In a systemic level, it means a deficit of democratic legitimization of the current status quo. The polls, polls shows a growing appointment with a state of democracy. According to the Pew Research Center, the large majority of population of major European state voices dissatisfaction with the way democracy works in their countries. Uh, for example, 43% of Germans, 55 of Brits, 51 of French, 70 of Italians, 81 of the Spanish. The proper addressee of their aggression, reluctance and frustration is therefore the political system that takes away the chance to have a clean slate without the inherited debts. Therefore, the first requirement in a reset is shaking off those broadly defined burdens of negotiation and subordination. The problem is that stability preserves poverty as well as um, privileges. Hope for equality and political agency will not be fulfilled without the limits on the privileges of the benef beneficiaries of the system. And that is requirement number two. The problem, though, is essentially political. It's about power, the sense of agency, about reclaiming reality that was slipped out of the democratic system and of checks and balances. The idea is perhaps best illustrated in the leaf slogan, take back control. It is about taking back control over the formal and especially informal centers of power, which function beyond the control of the democratic methods. Unfortunately, the need for a reset that would make things new does not seem to be possible within the current rules of the game. I will not dwell on the fact that revolution certainly is not the way to go, neither I, am not, I, 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 neither I consent with the myths of perfect equality of nations. The point is that the current political system cannot meet the requirement of even the slightest form of a reset. The power of democratic policy based on liberalism does not extend over the ter territory where inequalities are at the war, the territory of social and economic life. Politics may at best preserve inequalities, may slight adjustment, but is not able to reset them. Political instruments that the people have during elections do not affect the informal power structure. To achieve a peaceful, non-revolutionary reset, the existing rules need to be redefined. And that in turn calls for a broad political consensus. It would also require the beneficiaries of the current system to exercise, exercise self-restraint. There are, however, no signs of such readiness to develop control among the elites. But second is a political reset in action. I uh, call three examples from very old time, Mesopotamian, uh, Athenian, and the Old Testament. The need for a system reset that is no longer able to settle its internal force, tensions, and aspirations was not invented by the post-war democratic rule of law. Such an issue usually arises in a situation where unadjusted stability becomes toxic and where the void between the intuition of justice and the reality becomes unbearable. If according to Aristotle, the relationship between the wealth and the poor is the biggest challenge in every force, the ability to deal with the calls for a reset or a serious adjustment that would cancel the excessive burdens, limitations, and inequalities is the highest art of stable politics. Let us have a look at the lessons 
that distant past teaches us. The aim is not to study history or copy those solutions, but to look closer at their basic tenets that allowed one to face the problem of prolonged political stability. Mesopotamia. The institution of debt cancelling in ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Greece has all the features of reset understood as an act of restoring social, political, and ownership balance. Since the debts of the impoverished farmers would lead to land, wealth, and power concentration on one hand, and the loss of property or personal freedom on the other, the shaking of the debts was not a purely financial operation. Archaeologists have found around 30 Jews and obligation on Alman, acts referring to debt owned by the people, the wealthy officials in the period between 2400 and 1400 before Christ in Mesopotamia. It seems that the annulment was the guarantee of the stability of the existing political, social, and economic order. The annulment paid with the release from that slavery and the obligation to either pay compensation or return the property taken over for debts by the lenders was to guarantee peace and stability and to restore the status quo ante that was destroyed by economic chaos. During the 42 years of Hammurabi rule, there were at least four events of that kind, of this kind. Without an exaggeration, they may be first of all associated with the idea of the protection of the weak against the mighty expressed in the royal codex. The second motive behind this event is also perfectly clear. That element obviously strengthened and stabilized the monarch. By limiting the power of the court officials, it reduced the risk of change within the political order. Interestingly, the political significance, significance of an element that's really what I think would underline through a solemn ritual during which clay tablets with the names of debtors were smashed and destroyed. The periodical annulment of debts suggests that the ownership rules were suspended, though they were considered vital to the order and stability of a system. The Mesopotamian practice testifies to the sense that is completely absent from the modern world. A sense that the stability of the law does not necessarily entail a social stability. What is more, under certain circumstances, the um, unterrible law, which is intended to protect the process of wealth concentration, in fact, may be a destructive factor within the existing order. A partial suspension of the rules initiated by a ruler becomes the condition for the stability of an existing power and social structure. So it means that this continuity thus becomes a condition for a continuity. Ancient Greece. Let us now move over to Greece. The political fame of Solon was built on the reforms that may, that in many ways may be seen as a model reset. The agents of the early sixth century before Christ saw the growing tension between the wealthy landowners, the Eupatridae, may be translated as of a good father of the northern descent, and their indebted tenure on agricultural land called the Hectomer, six parties, who were obliged to give away one of the, the, to give away the one sixth of the yields from the land walked by them. The problem escalated and called for an urgent solution. Rising rural popular the rising rural population density because of the vision and thinking of farms that impoverishment and death slavery. By the time in uh, 594 BC, when Solon and Eupatrid himself uh, was selected an archon for one year and was invited with a reform mission, so by the time Athens has already lived through several, several, several waves of major social and political unrest. According to Plutarch, 
colonies mandate to reform came in equal measure from both sides of the ongoing conflict, from the both sides of the ongoing conflict, the wealthy and the impoverished attempts. As he took up the role of the mediator and law giver, Colon had to balance of continuity and change that would satisfy both parties. It was not an easy compromise. On one hand, the impoverished debtors demanded a new land division, new land division, redemption from slavery, and condition of the rule that forced them to give away a sick big crops. On the other, the Upatri required the slightest necessary concession. How did Solon meet their, their expectations? The annulled financial obligation abolished debt slavery, made possible slave redemption, and introduced debt relief from the debtor's farm. All these were gestures aimed to pacify the hectamen. At the same time, he kept the old land divisions, which was the solution in favor of continuity. And while we mostly remember Solon shaking off or relief of burdens, stays Arteia, the few seem to remember the accompanying political and social reforms that made reset possible and effective. At least two reforms are worth mentioning here. The first one is the institution of jury trial, trial. The second one was the close pairing of a citizen's political privileges and duties with one of the four income groups. It seems that both principles were introduced in the second wave of the reform. The trial by jury limited the judicial monopoly of aristocracy and strengthened political agency of the people. The alignment of political duties with income groups removed the poorest citizen from offices and reserved the highest offices for the richest. At the same time, it, once and for all, the principle of aristocratic rule by birth as a decisive qualification for oligarchy was replaced by a principle of wealth. There are several reasons why Solon's reform can be considered as a parallel reset. First of all, it was preceded by a mutual agreement of the parties which created a so-called constitutional moment, which ensures legality of the fundamental changes within the parties. Secondly, by modifying systemic monopoly of Upatridae, the reforms went far beyond the economic and social sphere. In fact, they took into account the political aspiration of the people. Third, the reforms were the minimal required adjustment. They meet the expectations of a sixth party, Spectomeroid, and at the same time, they didn't cast the Eupatridae into a loser's side. Solon reset preserves political continuity. In contrast to the reset caused by a war or revolution, it was a compromise whereby a legal change has been introduced in the name of peace and the balance of justice, which both parties believed were the common good. And now third example from Old Testament, that example of reset. Yet another interesting example of the institutional reset is the Tebat. Yeah, traditionally observed in Judaism every seven years and the Jubilee year once every 50 years. The Shabbat year, or sabbatical, is mandated by Old Testament that while in the case of Mesopotamia, we may have doubts as to whether the tradition of reset were indeed pending. In the case of Judaism, we are dealing with the institution that is part of a political system. Its task is to constantly correct the pathologies of stability. 
The Shabbat year is celebrated in a seven-year cycle and is analogous to the weekly Shabbat. In that, it means refraining from work activities. It is also connected with the idea of returning the initial flame to the starting point, which degenerates with the passing of time and due to human Therefore, the Shabbat year is not only rest for the people and land, but the reset for itself. It brings the environment of unwanted yet legal changes, shaking of the debts, redemptions from debt slavery, release of the land taken for them. Interestingly, it incorporates a system which calculates prices proportionally according to the time left to Shabbat year. In order to observe Shabbat year is of the highest seriousness and sanction. According to the book of Leviticus, God instituted Shabbat on Mount Sinai. Failure to observe the Shabbat year may result in disaster that could affect the entire nation. It is noteworthy that the obligation of a Shabbat year is not an arbitrary command. The idea of returning the land to its owner and redemption from their slavery is theologically grounded. In the strict sense, the land of Canaan is the gift from God and reminds his possession. Quote, the land also shall not be sold forever because it is mine and you are strangers and sojourners with me. It's from the book of Leviticus chapter 25. Verse Similarly, that slavery may only be temporary. Within the same time, the right of the owner had to yield the laws of God Himself, who freed the Israelites from captivity and become their law. The practice of the Shabbat year and the Jubilee year is thus a way to honor God as a liberator. It is a form of paying tribute to the Lord that serves as a reminder of the non-absolute nature of all man-made laws. The basis of reset is freedom that cannot be taken away from heaven, and the basis of freedom is the relationship of Israel with God. In the light of the above, I would like to make two remarks. The idea of Shabbat here clearly suggests that stability does not protect against evil and decay, and against contingency and uncertainty. In other words, stability does not have any eschatological features. It does not mark the end of the history. That is why keeping order requires certain regular hygiene. It is a constant restoring of the order. Adjustment that cause called for is not an action against stability, but rather a political tool that helps to maintain stability. But beware, reset is the temporary suspension of the rules, it does not erase them. Flexibility is the condition of continu continuity. Like all human reality, no rules are perfect. Evil may appear as we break the rules as much as when we respect them. They are not for their own sake. And if they lead to injustice, they ought to be suspended. Neither are they bad. It is thanks to the rules that the world escapes anarchy after the reset. The biblical model of the reset, that's the second remark, illustrates why the secular politics, the one we live in, tend to, tend to absolutize its own rules and procedures, even the ones that cause a crisis. Without references to God, every relativization of rules that reproduce political order and stability, for example, the annulment of the rights of the creditor, 
process a risk to the entire system. Very higher principle is missing whenever the specific rules are being changed, we fear that we are losing points of reference. The primacy of divine laws about the human laws means that the instituted structures, that the instituted structures remain flexible and their adjustment does not give an exceptionally dangerous impression that the political order is based on the arbitrary rules. In secular models, the contingency of rules reminds the thought of mystery. The rigidity, the, the rigidity of the rules, the seriousness, alleged immutability and absolutization becomes a security required. Conclusion, waiting for Solomon. All these examples have to explain why the serious adjustment of the system today is so difficult. Our diagnosis of the origins of a crisis differs depending on where we stand in it. Neither do we have a single version for the future. Things are not made better by the secularization of politics and the fact that freedom and equality got detached from their ontological ground. The one that would be natural for readers of Torah and Cosmos. That is even worse, the conflict between the people and the aristocracy has been so called aristocracy, that as has been, I'm not talking about aristocracy or love, of course, has been branded as the conflict between the populists and oligarchs. The conflict has become a sort of war with only one side best time to be a winner. That is obviously nonsense. The idea of word without them, either without the dark, neither mob or without the corrupted elites, is a dangerous fiction. Why is that so? Because the conflict that is defined as existential blocks any hopes for de-escalation, that is a condition for a reset, and leaves only two ways out. To put it simply, the first one, the first one is non-liberal dictatorship. The second is a form of a post-liberal dictatorship that will keep the power and status quo of a current elites in the name of stability, but will radically limit the citizens' freedom and will introduce a sort of a permanent state of emergency, pretending it to be a temporarily suspended democracy. Both solution are repulsed. To avoid them, the system has to regain its balance. This conflict escalation will not only generate chaos and terror. We can already see the first symptoms of the two scenarios in Europe. To take a different route, we need an agreement between the modern hectameroi with today's eupatrids. Is there a chance for it? Thank you very much. So, um, for me, I particularly applaud the questions you pose. As we know, good questions always contain within them a kind of wisdom and a tra transformative potential. And the good questions also, as you pose, challenge re relevant assumptions that typically drive the way in which problems are defined and resolved. And similarly, like you, Darius, I'm not so optimistic about the kind of resetting indicated, especially when in this scenario that you said, are we waiting for Solomon? Well, the examples, the stories, the ancient stories you told to, to pacify people, to guarantee stability, to establish status quo, tend to reinforce the separation between those who are designated to be the ruling, the ruler, the government, and the ones who are uh, defective, the rule and the government. So this what you, you already highlighted the kind of the contradictions within those. I will not comment on the, the problem instead. I prefer to dwell on the main question at the beginning of your paper. Why is it that uh, why is the most important and probably the most successful 
post-war um, political project of the West is so, so universally challenged. So as you pointed out, what makes this seemingly successful is that unprecedented then five years of security, order, stability, prosperity. So then what is it that people are doubting? And could it be the very system, basically asking, could it be the very system that underpinned the Western liberal democracy? But in many ways, the witness of liberal democracy has been well documented, and he also critique that. And they point to the failures of Western democracy so prevalent, so prevalent that there are few truly innovative alternatives, hence the reset. We all agree with that. However, to reset and to seek systemic transformation, it requires to have a thorough understanding of the political project and to have some kind of normative basis of politics. And here's my attempt to return to the world. So it, this particular project, the resetting, inspired me to offer three tentative ideas to explore with you and with all of you, all of which already implicit in the main question of this paper. The first one, just very briefly, it will be the reconceptualization of what we call the, the direction of that particular project. And in this case, not just stability, but peace. But then how might we understand peace beyond the mere order, stability, and the colonization of capital? The second would be reconsideration of the fundamental principle to underpin democracy. How do we postulate equality? And the third is the rearticulation of the principle of political engagement. How we might, how people of all background might act upon their political agency that they are so concerned with and participate in political processes. And I think the essential sort of the motif of the conference, the tension between the Dionysic and, and the Apollonian dynamic, can serve as an ideal backdrop for me to, to share some ideas with you. The first one. Peace as a political direction. Here I want to offer a principle of well-being. So a typical conception of, 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 of uh, this direction tend to define peace as order, security, freedom, and prosperity. And these conceptions assume that peace is the absence, what is non-peace, what is the opposite of peace, such as chaos, violence, tyranny, and poverty. And therefore to prevent this non-peace, Peace involves rules of law, military forces, centralized state aid and, and institutions, liberal politics, and the wealth accumulation, uh, accumulating um, economic, economy. This is the progress model that you critiqued. And to understand peace, not as a negative term, but as a notion with a positive attribute, we might do two things. The first is to understand conflict. What is conflict in human life? Is conflict avoidable? If conflict is always already present in the ebbs and flows of human life, owing to our human inherent difference, then the peacefulness, peace, must recognize conflict and tension and enable them to become drivers for positive change. It's like tensions and conflict can be the invitation for change. But the second, is to embrace and affirm what is really the content of peace, peacefulness, of what constitutes peace. For me, it is to say yes to life. It's a Dionysian formation of life, affirming the totality of our meaning in nature's words. Um, hence, peacefulness denotes the features of, of, of the good life, the emergence of something affirmative. What is affirmative? And it is our flourishing, our well being. And the one we locate well being in life or eudaimonia in the life itself is ne it necessarily transcend the simplistic economic definition of the concept. So the principle of well being will determine not only the direction of the political project, 
but also provides the evaluative lens for us to examine its fruit. So that's the first idea. The second idea is to look at democracy. And here I want to put forward the principle of an instrumentalization and equality. What well, political direction of the well being starts to highlight peace as a human value. Now, peace assumes that persons are bearers of values. And bearers of values, we ourselves should have a non derivative and non instrumental value. It is this non instrumental value, or some people call it the intrinsic value of ourselves, that constitutes human dignity. Any form of instrumentalization of persons violates precisely this dignity, be it oppression, alienation, marginalization, discrimination, and even demonization. So in politics, instrumentalization often happens through the ways that the elites perpetuate, the elites perpetuate, perpetuate power. So when those in power use power, to retain power or regain power rather than use it to improve the well being of the majority, like the, 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 the kind of the complaint of, of, of those people who are asking for a revolution. And because of this, the system is open to all kinds of lobbying, political advocacy, and so on. Hence, the voice of people are converted to vote, and the vote became means to retain or regain power, thus, instrumentalizing people's and voices. So instrumentalization also assumes the hierarchy of society where we are all subject to some kind of antagonism. So upon the principle of non-instrumentalization, I would add the claim that all persons are non-instrumentally valuable, which should form the basis of the principle of equality. So the current political system leaves many people without access to political process and without voice in this it, because precisely it fails the demo, uh, uh, as a democratic forum with respect to this criterion of equality. Now, so this leads to the third idea. The third idea is how it is it's about our political process and engagement, which I would put forward the idea to show you the idea principle of participatory So any political system consistent with the end of peace as well being of all and the fundamental principle of equality ought to be direct participatory democracy versus representative and democracy. Indeed, the principle of democratic participation can enable us to collectively shape a shared world, world towards better. So this principle conveys inclusive, collaborative, deliberative, and harmonious process of political engagement. Be non-violent, non-antagonistic, relationally enriching, and caring. At a minimum level, it ought to involve the creation of various types of public spaces. And, and Hannah Rand called it the spaces for political inquiry and deliberation. And in these public spaces, the political agent and learn to practice the arts of dialogue. And we can, we can talk about the arts of dialogue, including deep listening, openness to otherness and to difference, and personal sharing and the mutual understanding. So in dialogue, we can also witness, partake and experience life suffering and exercise, mystery and union in the most intimate way. But you also concerned um, with two more ideas, that is power and trust. So I thought these three ideas um, does not leave power behind, but instead power as collaborative, as in Spinoza, rather than competitive, as, as in uh, on sports. And power does not require the governing that leads over the governed majority. But in terms of trust, since trust is intentional, what makes trust primarily politically relevant in this case is precisely the three principles. For instance, where there is well being, when the people experience well being, there's a trust in the political direction. And where there is respect and equality, then there's a trust in the political institutions. And where there's a common space for dialogue 
and not for critique, and, and to access our agency. So there's a trust in political processes. So that's my, um, 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 that, that's what these three ideas is what you inspired me to share in this forum. And thank you, and thank you to Thank you very much indeed, uh, Sherto. And let me, let me make one or two comments of my own, and then we have a very little bit of time. You can then take it to a coffee break and uh, I discuss further. Thank you very much indeed for, for the presentation and for pointing up to us that actually looking to the past may be a good way of seeing what the possibilities are for the future. The, the great Irish poet Seamus Heaney did something the same. He turned to the Greek dramatist Sophocles and, and turned Sophocles' play into a poem called The Pure uh, Foil. I'm just going to read it. It's not a long poem, unlike some of his poems. This is not a, a long poem. Human beings suffer. They torture one another. They get hurt and get hard. No poem or play or song can fully right a wrong inflicted and endured. The innocent in jails beat on their bars together. A hunger striker's father stands in the graveyard dumb. The police widow in veils faints at the funeral warning. History says, don't hold on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the longed-for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. So hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge. Believe that a further shore is reachable from here. Believe in miracle and cure and healing well. Call miracle self-healing. The utter self-revealing double take of feeling. If there's fire on the mountain or lightning and storm and a god speaks from the sky, that means someone is hearing the outcry and the birth cry of a new life at its turn. It means once in a lifetime that justice can rise up and put at history rhyme. Now, of course, Seamus Heaney was writing this in the context of Ireland, and there are a number of references there to prisoners in jail, hunger strikers, police winners, and so on. And he wasn't taking one side of it, but he was saying, if we look at history, we, we come to a similar kind of conclusion that there is, there's not a lot of indication for hope. We keep getting ourselves into trouble. And yet, and yet there are possibilities. And the paradox that you pointed out, Darish, I think is one that really merits a lot of thought and consideration. This notion that we have had, and it's been said a great deal over the last number of years, that, that the European project, for example, recommends itself because we have had no war in generations. And wars are awful things, absolutely terrible things. But what you're saying to us, yes, but simply not having war may in time become a problem itself. And it, it reminded me of, of a line which all of you will, will know very well. And it has a, a kind of interesting resonance. So some of you know um, this Center for the Federation of Tropical Conflict came out of the work of the World Federation of Scientists based in Sicily. And possibly the, the best known 20th century work to come out of Sicily is the, the, the book The Leopard by Lampedusa. And uh, he, he had this curious and extremely well known phrase in it. Unless we take, unless we ourselves take a hand now, this is the, the royalists, they'll voice the republic on us. If we want things to stay as they are, things will have to change. If we want things to stay as they are, things will have to change. And that doesn't mean everything will change and everything will stay the way it is. That's a paradox that's completely impossible. But there is nevertheless a paradox here that is not impossible. So how do we try to understand it in, in practical terms? Well, one of the paradoxes 
And it's why we put two gods together, the paradox of, of logical rationalism, on which the Enlightenment was largely based, and the power and importance of emotion. I see that Dominic Johnson is, is on the call, and, and Dominic Johnson, a very interesting book published 13 years ago, I think, by Princeton University Press, pointing out that the, the notion that somehow or another our feelings, our emotions, our things to be put to the side and got rid of because we need to astray. Um, in actual fact, sometimes they take us beyond our rational understanding to intuition and determination, which leads to extraordinary outcome. That's a really difficult challenge for people in universities because the whole commitment is to a rational understanding of things. And yet, to be truthful, the more you work in universities, the more emotional, <laughs> irrational, and also of the relationships are between people who are in the university. But maybe that's part of the problem, that if you if you think rationality is everything, then you don't know how to deal with the other side of the humanity, which is actually absolutely crucial. So this notion of holding things together that appear to be in conflict with each other, that's what the whole business of these process in Ireland was about. It was taking two groups of people with different culture, well, just different identities and different aspirations, so with different culture, different ways of thinking about things, different ways of being in the world, and trying to find a way that they could engage together. It is fundamentally about trying to find pluralism that you can operationalize in politics and in society. And it's an enormous struggle. And the stability problem, in a sense, it seems to me is that this is not on the one hand by actual individualism, or on the other side by the majority of a community running a school for everybody. But it is an attempt to hold these two things together. And for me, what that's about is relationship. It's relationship between communities. And that's the thing that you've been struggling with at home. They're not equal relationships, but they need to be fair relations. We have, in a way, got such a notion about equality, which is a completely false perspective. Equality is absolutely impossible to deliver, not just in the practice, but in theory, it is impossible to deliver. But fairness, that's a different thing. Fraternity, no, fraternity is when you get together with people like you. That's not the issue. The question is community. How do I live together with people who are in my patch and I don't agree with them, have a different way of thinking about them? So it's not, to me, anymore about liberty, equality, and fraternity. It's about freedom, yes, but it's about fairness and community. And struggling to work with that is a real Child, there's no simple answer to that. It's a struggling with it, but that's what relationships are like. I often say to colleagues, if you've got a relationship that you think is sorted, it's already in trouble because you think it's sorted. Relationships are dynamic things that you have to constantly work at. And that's true at an individual level, and it's true at a community level. And if you simply try to keep things the same, and all have that wit and temptation when well, they're good. You don't have to wish them to stay the same when they're not. But when they're good, we want to keep them safe. But what Lampedusa is putting into the mouth of, uh, of the young man is that if we want those essential things to, to, to stay the same, the relationship, if we want a good relationship, it doesn't stay a good relationship by staying the same. It stays a good relationship by evolving and developing and growing. And so I, the thing that I really took very much out of what you're saying was this challenge that what we have thought, and I, you know, I've said it like most politicians who have been throwing you have said, wasn't this an extraordinary recommendation? We did not have a war in more than two generations, and we did. There's no question about that. A war is awful. But the assumption that if you don't have war, it's all going swimming. In fact, the pressures may be building and building. And as I often say, dams do not work gradually. The pressure builds gradually, but someday they just burst. And I think you're pointing us to the fact that we may be closer to such a burst than we would like to be if we don't hurt them. Well, thank you very much. We need the director, Sherpa, for, for their interventions.
And we've just got a couple of minutes, five minutes perhaps, to pick up some comments, questions, or thoughts. Please. Uh, hello, brilliant. Thank you for the United States. We're from the common vote on the anti war left and the failure of the conservative right to keep our security apparatuses. Why are we spending all this money nation building abroad? Why don't we nation build here at home? So, A, how do you think the kind of region you're talking about might help to relegitimize the security apparatus? And B, did you find any examples from antiquity of public outcry against the public costs of waging war and maintenance of empire? Can we take any two, three questions before we go back to the audience? Important question. I don't know whether you folk uh, online heard it, but it's it's pointing out the challenges in the United excuse me the United States. And the question is whether from antiquity there are any examples of how the people rebelled against the extraordinary cost of war and security, and that that led to some fundamental change in the way things work. Any other questions or comments? And, and we can certainly take some uh, from uh, from our colleagues online. By chat probably brings them up on the screen most quickly and most easily. And we can we can chat and read at the same time as we pick up some more comments from the room here. Any other interventions that anyone would like to make? Go on. Uh, thanks. Uh, enjoy the presentation. I mean, uh, where I come from Southeast Asia, there's a uh, a lot of uh, academic uh, discussion on the role of culture in determining uh, what is a politically good outcome. So, for example, uh, in, uh, in the month of the literature in uh, Southeast Asia for many years, the discussion about you know, whether or not uh, liberal democracy is uh, public good, which fits all societies everywhere all the time. Uh, and this goes back to, for example, how in the past, there were discussions of uh, not so much uh, non liberal, not, not uh, illiberal democracy, uh, ancient forms of democracy, where, for example, the emphasis would be on society above itself, by striking the right balance between the community and the individual. So, the thing which uh, I thought was very interesting was, which got me thinking was, if you look at what some of the cultural psychologists of uh, look at, they do mention that, you know, perhaps uh, whether or not a society is collectivist as opposed to individualistic is a factor that should be considered in such a discussion and debate as well. Thanks so much, Kutma. Liz. Could I just throw in um, the response to Stelter? Uh, a, a definition of positive peace, which we developed in Oxford, and for the network box piece, yeah, um, so that slightly piece of piece building as well, and it chimes in very much with what you were saying. There. So, our definition of positive peace is human security and human flourishing in a sustainable environment with the constructive management of problems. Many of the things you're saying fit into that. Thanks very much, Liz. Let me take what, one more one more comment before I come back to Gary. Peter, was there anything else that you wanted to pick up on and respond? I was on Rich. Yeah. So absolutely terrific. Probably I don't know how long the essay was, 10,000 words or so laid out. Very nice depth of understanding of, of the problem of friends. And then you finish with about two sentences of what your recommendations might be. And so what I would like to see is all possible. Your next lecture, you build on those two sentences, bring us back to the 10,000. Thanks, I want to do the Let's come back to you then for any comment you wish to make on your intervention. Thank you very much for your technical understanding. I mean, probably much deeper what we are missing. Yeah, we are missing. That's, 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 that's the big man in us. So you describe the needs of the people who are rebelled by telling what is missing, what's I mean a part of your question. Probably. 
Um, John, you, you remind me it was an interview with a uh, fascinating Polish pianist, Christian Zimmerman. And I remember a part when a uh, um, uh, journalist interviewing uh, Zimmerman says, Oh, Master, you did a huge international career. Uh, Zimmerman, who is a very intelligent chap, laughed and says, uh, Lady, with an uh, international career, it's like with uh, two big pants. You have always kick it. <laughs> and, and that's exactly what, uh, what uh, you, you make me think that the problem which I tried to enlighten was that the stability is dynamic reality. The stability is, in itself is instable. And that because we have no theoretical and practical experience in the European tradition. I don't know how is it, it's a very interesting question, how is it in the, uh, for example, Asian uh, tradition where stability is, I mean, used to be much bigger than in, let's say, our circle. But we have no experience practically, both intellectuals, so we, we tend to absolutize that, um, that reality. Uh, Cameron and Rich asked me what kind of reset. I mean, fortunately, being a philosopher, not a lawyer and politician, yeah. for me, the highest ambition is to describe by precise uh, how the reality is looking like. Uh, Of course, I have some ideas, but it's connected with, in fact, other big problem, uh, which I should address to the question why our democracy not give the agency of the people. I mean, where from? But as in that as in that text, I try to look for systemic reason, not on symptoms, because we are always focused on symptoms, say Cambridge Analytica, Trump, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that that is that's my feeling. It's a symptom. It's a symptom of situation, not a, not a reason. We, when we are going to reason, have to analyze the. Mechanisms uh, of a uh, of the political order which affect um, problem, and I think there are some systemic reasons which which uh, limit paradoxically very strongly the agency of nowadays very strong, but maybe of course uh, next time it will be a chance to to share with you. That opinion. Um, uh, you ask about the culture and resets. Uh, well, that's that's very very interesting and deep problem. I mean, I must say, I never in my life heard a dream of the end of a history. Maybe I'm not Hegelian enough. Maybe I'm not Kantian enough. I don't know, uh, maybe some problem with my distance to German philosophy, or maybe it's also cultural purpose, but it, I never believed in the in the end of history. That's why I do not believe in the best, objectively best political system. I mean, that's that's a political system to be like a, like like a good 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 clock. I mean it should Speech to the reality, fulfilling those needs of peace which you wish to describe in your definition. But it could be liberal democracy that fulfills that, uh, that uh, needs. But it may, it may be also uh, just monarchy or Aristotle's. I mean, I don't think that we have the only one model which is universally good. That's uh, that's a problem we've been confronted in Poland with um, 
dream of their own political order taken from a bureaucracy and it has certain, I mean, it creates certain problems with culture, with political tradition, with many others. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So to very briefly talk one is we think she thought that some of the ideas that I was yet, for example, the year of Saturn and the Jubilee year are all very bad in theory for a philosopher, but they're not practical politics. Don't forget that there was a very major international effort at Jubilee and that debt forgiveness, very major effort at it, which was adopted by many of the political leaders around the world, it was actually led off. In many ways, by Gordon Bryan, former prime minister in the United Kingdom. So, so these things may be difficult and distant, but the idea that they are politically impossible simply is a, a lack of imagination. There are things that are hard to do. 